Up next on America and the Courts, a New York court decides on same-sex marriage. And then the life and legacy of Betty for Dan. After that, Federal Reserve Board Chair Ben Bernanke delivers a commencement address at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This is C-SPAN's America and the Courts. Next oral argument in four New York same-sex marriage cases. This week we'll hear from attorneys arguing against gay marriage. New York's highest court will decide if marriage licenses can be given to same-sex couples based on New York's constitution. Currently there are legal challenges to same-sex marriages in 10 states. California, Connecticut, Florida, Iowa, Maryland, Nebraska, New Jersey, New York, Oklahoma, and Washington State. Uh, Mr. Kerner. Thank you, Your Honor. First, I do want to address one open issue in terms of whether a fundamental right has been recognized in response to Judge Smith's question. The answer is not by any appellate court in the country, including Massachusetts, which relied instead on an idiosyncratic interpretation of rational basis. But I would like, before I address the specific issues, I would like to give a little historical legal development to explain why, when we reach the conclusion that what they're asking for is quite dramatic. Historically, the end of the 1800s, in a case Maynard versus Hill, it was one of the first cases of the Supreme Court dealing with the concept of marriage. And essentially, there were two wives. And the uh, man left the first one, went to Oregon, and uh, married the second. And, the, and in Oregon, he obtained a divorce from the first one without telling the first one about the divorce. And he also inherited property. And the issue was, for the Supreme Court, who gets the property? And essentially what the Supreme Court said was the definition of marriage, who can marry, and how can marriage be dissolved, was exclusively for the legislature. And since the Oregon legislature had established the process for divorce, and the man had complied with that process, the second wife would obtain the property. New York was similarly situated. Uh, they, there's this argument that we haven't yet defined marriage, that we can treat it as men, women, men, men, women, men. I understand the argument, but I don't stand ignoring fear and verse trainer. Because in the 1930s, in a case involving the abolition of the cause of action of the right to marry, this court specifically said that the marriage is between a man and a woman. But more than that, said that it's a contract between two people controlled by the state through the legislature. And if the legislature wants to abolish a cause of action, it had the right to do so. It has the right to... The legislature's power over marriage is, is limited by, uh, obviously, by the Equal Protection Clause under Loving That's against correct. Virginia. That's correct. I'm going to deal with Loving, but I'm only in the 1920s, Your Honor. <laughs> but I, but I, will, I will deal with Loving, and, I, and I'm going to tie. But at least as of now, there's exclusive control of the definition within the legislature. Mauricio was another case it was decided by this very court, and indeed was the precursor to Skinner versus Oklahoma. And Maurizio, the woman refused <coughs> to have sex with the man because he wouldn't go through a religious ceremony. And the issue was whether she could sue for abandonment and lack of support. And this court said that the reason for marriage is the begetting of offspring. It was the procreative aspect of marriage that it focused on, not the relationship of the two people, and said it was the foundation of civilization. And since the woman would not participate in the act which would lead to the procreation, she would not be entitled to support. Later on in the 1940s, the Supreme Court in Skinner versus Oklahoma actually mirrored that. And in Skinner, again, the emphasis was not on the relationship. It was on the procreation aspect, because the statute there allowed for sterilization, where an individual was convicted of more than one crime of moral turpitude. If he was, he could be sterilized. 
。And the Supreme Court said that marriage was so fundamental because of the procreative aspect, not the relationship. What, what relevance? Of what relevance is procreation today? The、It、other、is. side、oh, seems to、yes. say it's not too relevant, or, or at least that's.、Um, The relevance. I may be putting words in their mouths, but it's saying that is it is not so central to marriage today. But it is, Your Honor, because the purpose of the regulation of marriage is to encourage stability by having the solemnization, where you have two people who procreate and have issue. What you want is encourage stability of the family. How, Does that mean? Have medical is, advances changed that yes, situation? Yes. Yes. And all that means is an argument can be made before the legislature that there is a reason to include another group that is not exactly similar, but the vast issues still come as a result of biological procreation between man and woman through the marriage. Doesn't the and, I'm sorry. Doesn't the, how, doesn't the, how, sorry. how does same, allowing same-sex marriage intrude upon that state interest? But that's not the issue. The question. But how does it? How, excuse me. How does allowing same-sex marriage intrude on or impair but, that state interest? But the, under the rational base, which I'll get to, that doesn't matter. It's not. The question is whether or not there's a rational basis. If, as we contend, the purpose is still viable, then the issue is whether there's a constitutional compulsion to include them, not whether it's desirable. Because, after all, when you decide it's there's a constitutional compulsion. On the least substantive test, rational basis, you are saying the legislature cannot choose to include. You are making and, the and procreation is the only rational basis for the heterosexual marriage, <clears throat> or is it? That has the that it is, it is the emphasis. Yes, yes. Is there any other? Well, it, so it ties in with tradition and the management of tradition, but the main reason is, is the upbringing of children something different from、uh, from procreation. Can could、uh, could the legislature uh, prefer a uh, uh, that children be brought up in opposite sex households?、Uh, do I think they can make that judgment based on a study? The answer is yes, but I don't believe that's the original reason. The original reason was to create a process where when men and women get together. Society has judged that this would increase stability. They were dealing with the vast look. There's no question you could argue, for example, that people who can't have children shouldn't get the benefit of it. But if a statute is over or under inclusive, you don't throw out the statute and compel including another group. You say to the legislature, hear their arguments, and if they have legitimate arguments, as the Supreme Court has said, in the end, that those arguments will be sustained and they will be included. How do you deal with? I was、Turner、going to get to loving. I didn't forget. No, no. You. Well, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to distract you again. Okay.、Uh, now, now I'm going to ask you about Turner.、Oh, that's my next uh, step. Uh, how do you deal with Turner against whoever it was,、uh, where the, where the、uh, Supreme Court held that two prison inmates who were in different different prisons and not going to procreate with anybody that they had a、Because、fundamental what, right to yes, marry? Because what? Yes. But what they said in that particular case, at some point, those inmates would be hoped to be released, and you still had the purpose of the marriage and the procreative aspect. Again. Marriage is not doesn't mean that everybody within it fits the definition, but if it has a purpose that's rational, the fact that it's under or over inclusive doesn't mean you automatically include another group. Now I'll get to Loving, as I promised. In 1967, Loving was decided, and it's on this basis that the appellants argue that this created not only a right to marry but a right to choose. It did not. It was a very limited holding. It was only a right to choose in that case. Because, as Your Honor said, it was discrimination based on race. But this is not the idle musings of an orator before this court. This was confirmed five years later in the case Baker v. Nelson, which I have described at length in my. And I'm going to take a few minutes to discuss it because I feel it is very, very important to this case. And Baker, and two individuals of the same sex applied for a marriage license in. Minnesota, in a small town in Minnesota, they were denied it because the statute only allowed the marriage between a man and a woman. It went up to the Minnesota Supreme Court, and the basis of the argument for the Minnesota Supreme Court was it violated equal protection, due process clause of the federal constitution, and discriminated based on gender. Another argument you heard before this court. The Supreme Court of Minnesota noted the fact of the procreative、uh, purpose. Said that it was rational based on discrimination between man and woman, 
and people of the same sex, that they are not going to substitute their judgment for the legislature, and, di and distinguish loving in the manner I just said. In other words, that loving was based on the racial exclusion, and it was not a general right to choose, which well, would be- Well, if you stayed with loving, though, Mr. Kerner- I'm it, sorry? If you stayed with loving, there, was an, in, there were two bases. There was the equal protection, but there was also the due process right yes, that the Supreme yes. Court and, recognized. Yes, and, your, and Your Honor, both were raised in the Minnesota case. And Minnesota specifically said, it was a racial exclusion. It was not intended to create a general right to choose, which was for the legislature. And it was dealing with the federal constitution, yes, and I will cover it? that, too. But, yes. but, but we're dealing with the New York State That's constitution. Correct. But in New York State, uh, you have consistently held, under the Equal Protection Clause, that your interpretation of equal protection is no broader than the interpretation given by the Supreme Court. And when you discuss equal protection cases, you cite Supreme Court decisions to that effect, and that's under 21 Catholic Home Bureau, Dorsey v. Stuyvesant, Esler v. What about, what about due process? Yes. You say you can go beyond that for due process purpose. But if it is rational and sustainable under equal protection, it's not going to be irrational under due process. Now, what happened, going back to Baker, was that under the procedure then in effect, you could appeal directly to the Supreme Court, and they did. And the Supreme Court dismissed that case for want of a substantial federal question. This court is held in Brady v. State, reflecting two Supreme Court decisions, Hicks v. Miranda and the Washington v. the Yaka Indomie Nation, that that is a decision on the merits as to what was argued before the Supreme Court and what was held. And what was argued before the Supreme Court was whether this violated due process, whether it violated equal protection, and whether it was sexual discrimination. <clears throat> After Baker, Ver now two arguments are made that I should deal with at least <clears throat> parenthetically. One is it says you have the right to make an independent determination under equal protection, and they discuss a case people versus Kern. That, does, that supports that position. In People v. Kern, there was an equal protection argument. It had to do with jury selection and excluding people based on race. And what you said there were there were two issues presented for your review under a Supreme Court case called Batson. One, you said, had already been decided in Batson, and you were bound. The second one, under equal protection, you can make your own independent determination under federal rules because it was never decided. That supports our position. Second, they argue, citing People v. Anafri, that you have, don't have to give substantial deference to a decision based on a determination that dismissed for one a substantial federal question. People v. Anafri, by the way, it's not fundamental, it's rational basis. That's just a side issue based on an earlier discussion. But in that case, what did you do with a case out of Virginia involving the same issue? You didn't say you didn't have to give it a precedential effect. You, after a page and a half of discussion concluded, based on an evaluation of the Virginia case, that it was decided on procedural, not meritorious grounds, and you confirmed that in a later opinion by the Supreme Court, in which you cited to that Supreme Court opinion, in which the lead judge writing for the majority said, we had never resolved the issue left open, so People v. Onofre was free to be decided without regard to the Supreme Court decision. In Mr. Kerner. Do we have to agree with uh, your position, or do we have to agree with you on the effect of the Supreme Court's decision in Baker for you to no. win? No. Even if Baker had not been decided, there were two other decisions of the Supreme Court, Cleburne and Glucksburg. What about Lawrence? I'm sorry? What about Lawrence? What effect yes. does Lawrence have of Baker, okay. in your view? One of the arguments made is that Lawrence somehow implies a change in Baker. Lawrence, as everybody well, knows, the dissenters in Barrons, the dissenters in, in uh, the dissenters in Lawrence certainly seem to think it implied a change. It did, but unfortunately, yes. But I don't think you can assume the dissent would have voted for same-sex marriage. Indeed, the dissent would have concluded that the criminal charges should have been disdained. But what the majority did. It is true one could speculate in Lawrence, in the absence of what I'm going to say, that Lawrence represented at least some part of a change in, the, in terms of how you view sexual orientation. What is interesting about Lawrence is two things. 
even though it involved the right of privacy in one's home, they did not use heightened scrutiny or compelling interest. They used rational basis. But second, in their holding, they specifically differentiated between the criminal charge and the request, which was not present before the court, to enter into a formal legal relationship, which they said would be a completely different issue. And Justice O'Connor, the sixth justice, confirmed on equal protection grounds, noting that this didn't involve an attempt to establish a marriage relations, would have been a very different question. So in Lawrence, not only it doesn't permit idle speculation, there's a clear rebuke to any implication that Lawrence would change the rule with respect to legal marriage relationships in contrast to criminal prosecution. Because just, Justice Scalia, though, says in his dissent, don't believe it. Is he right? No, I don't think so, because the majority conclusively responded to Justice Scalia and said, no, we don't mean this. We differentiate. They didn't leave it to speculation. But it certainly is not, an, it is not a hint that they're going to recognize it. And as I said, it's striking that they didn't use the right of privacy, which could have led to a compelling interest, instead did only rational basis. And in Roma v. Evans, another sexual orientation case, they also used, which had to do with a referendum and whether a referendum can prohibit political participation on the behalf of the people of the same sex, they also use rational basis. So it is clear that the appropriate test is rational basis. Now, has, there was, has, excuse me, has the legislature refused to deal with this issue of same-sex marriage, and do we take that into consideration in uh, deciding this case? Uh, the answer is you should not take it into consideration. The issue should be whether or not there's a constitutional compulsion as long as there's a rational basis. That should discharge your responsibility. But with respect to same sex, we listed on pages 54 and 55 of our brief all the changes that have been made by the legislature in furtherance of same sex relationships. Have they approved marriage? No, they have not. Has the issue been brought up? I, I really, I couldn't say. I'm sure it is raised. But the fact that it's not passed over some period of time doesn't mean there's a constitutional compulsion give them the, to give them relief when there is no constitutional basis for it. There is also a hint for, under equal protection that you've created a, another tier. I am not sure where that comes from. And for this very reason, I've looked at all the equal protection cases where you have reversed. You apply the same standard. If it's compelling, fundamental, heightened scrutiny, sexual discrimination, I'll deal with that in a minute. And rational basis has always been the same. And your court has said it's the paradigm of restraint, that if it's fairly debatable, you shouldn't touch it, as has the Supreme Court, because then you become a super legislature. I don't know where they get this distinction between personal rights and economic rights. Hope first paralysis, which had to do with reproductive rights, you applied rational basis, same test. In a case, I, I, I have, in McMinn, let, let me deal with McMinn since they rely on it. That had to do, as you know, with the town of Oyster Bay and the uh, zoning regulation, which differentiated between people of the same blood where they could have an enormous household and people underrelated, underrelated could only be limited to two people. And you said the purpose of the regulation, which was given by the town, was to reduce noise, reduce overcrowded parking, and make the area more attractive. And your point was, how does excluding them solve that problem? If you have a large household of related people, who are similarly situated to a small, what difference does it make? They're both increasing the problem. And so you apply the general test. I have never seen you apply a different test. Now, well, we, we apply, uh, we, the, all courts apply stricter scrutiny to certain categories. Uh, mm -hmm. And, it, and it isn't, isn't it to categories of people who are most likely to be the victims of abuse and discrimination? Yes. And aren't, and, uh, and aren't uh, homosexuals uh, almost a classic example of people who've been, uh, been abused and discriminated against for a long, long time and who need special protection? And the answer is no for this reason. Have they been discriminated against? Yes. Do they need protection? No, because under Kleberg, which is exactly the test you posit, the issue is, do they have political clout? If in, in that particular case it was- Well, but, but black people aren't without political clout either. We still apply, uh, we still apply uh, uh, strict scrutiny. Yes, but that's a historic, yes, but that's a historic fundamental basis. The difference here is that we're asking about creating a new right, which is either fundamental or strict scrutiny. 
And what Kleberg says is you don't, you should be reluctant to create new rights where they have political power because they've shown they can use the legislature and you don't want to act as a super legislature and take away their ability to participate in the political process. And in that particular case involving mental retardation, the court held that they reversed the circuit, which had held strict scrutiny, because that was a class that had been discriminated against. But then they pointed out that that class had been successful in obtaining su legislation. Have, have mentally retarded people really been victims of the same kind of discrimination that, that uh, homosexuals have? It may be a different type, but it, does, but, but it still doesn't deal with the issue, are they politically ineffective? And the truth is, they are politically effective. Indeed, my client has gone on record as saying he would support before the legislature, a legislative change. It's hard to say they're politically ineffective. They do not meet the test on the Cleburne, Your Honor. And that is, and, and also there's a general reluctance to create new rights. And the reason for that is because you don't want to intrude on the legislature's discretion. In effect, these individuals are not similar. The definition has been, is, the reason it's fundamental is it's deeply rooted. And I do not believe there is any constitutional compulsion to include them. And before I conclude on sexual discrimination, I'm only going to make a very brief comment. I don't understand it. As I understood sexual discrimination, it means a man is treated differently than a woman. There's some disability because of the sex. It's, it's been held, hasn't it, that, that male on male harassment or female on female harassment is sex discrimination. I don't know. No, no, I really well, don't. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's true, isn't it, that I mean, it's, 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 there's, there's discrimination in a literal sense. Uh, uh, you, one of their female clients can get married if she marries a man, but no. not if she marries a woman. I have to disagree with you. It's, it's, it's a discrimination based on sexual orientation, but it's, the, the female is not being treated differently than the male. That is the aim of the sex statute, the sexual discrimination statutes. Both of them can get married under the definition it is true they don't meet the definition, but that's for the legislature. The fact that they can't marry well, each But the other, definition takes sex into account. No, I do, it's circular, Your Honor, because the male is being treated exactly as the female is. I can't get married to a male. Judge Kay can't marry a female. We're being treated exactly the same. That is not, that, well, the purpose of the legislature was not to change that. Well, isn't this, isn't this an, another one of those things that depends on how you word it? I to mean, I, I, uh, yeah, Judge Kay can marry you, subject to maybe some impediments. I can't. Uh, that's, you know, what, what's the difference? To be candid with you, I, I have never seen, I, I've been never, I've never been able, I have never been able to follow this argument. I have read it. I, I admit an ignorance on my part. I have read the cases. I don't see a connection. I, I think I've exhausted this particular issue. Yes, I think we should go down a different road. <laughs> <laughs> the only other point I do want to make is that Trainer is not just an old case. Uh, even as recently <coughs> as 1970, there was an individual, and this really highlights why this is appropriate for the legislature. There was an individual who committed a crime against his wife. And he wanted the benefit of family court prosecution because I guess the rehabilitation portion was easier than if it was in criminal court. And essentially what he argued was his status was equal to a marriage, he, a marriage as defined in the statute. He said, I have a common law marriage which was recognized outside of New York and should be recognized inside New York. And this court said, it's up to the legislature to define marriage. Go to the legislature. But in the meantime, you don't meet the definition. Therefore, citing the very case I cited about a man and a woman and the legislature defines who can marry, the court refused to give him the benefit of the Family Court Act. This is really a classic uh, redefinition. And it is one where I do not believe they are similarly situated. They, are, they want to get the benefit of a historic definition. There's only one place for that, the legislature. I believe that's been reflected in each of the appellate division decisions, and we ask that all those orders be affirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kerner. Uh, Mr. Schiff. Judge Kay, may it please the court. Um, let me talk a little bit about I mean, our bottom line here is that if there are going to be changes, it ought to be done by the legislature. And 
I think there have been bills, all sorts of bills. I don't think there's been anything very active, as far as I can tell, although I haven't done real research on that question. But I would say that experience shows that while matters are in litigation, and this has now been in litigation for quite a while, the legislature is very reluctant to act, and uh, it's not likely to. Now, I think when, uh, after this court decides, hopefully in our favor, uh, there's every reason to think that that may change. They won't have the excuse that the matter is in court. And uh, I mean, one case in point that I remember um, a number of years ago, I argued in the uh, in defense of the health department smoking regulations, and uh, we lost uh, on the ground that the health department didn't have the authority to do that. And very soon thereafter, the legislature, because they thought it was right, uh, adopted uh, probably uh, rules that we've, or a statute that was even more stringent than the regulation. But there wasn't any reason for them to act, and there have been lots of uh, uh, wild things were pending in court, and there are a lot of other examples of that sort. <coughs> Um, so, um, I think I, I'd like to talk uh, a little bit uh, about what we have said and I think the third department has said as to uh, why the law is rational. And we believe that the state has had a uh, long interest uh, in channeling uh, opposite sex uh, relationships into marriage. Uh, and this is so that there would be a full family uh, rather than there would be no family for that. And so that this is in the state's interest and it's also in, in, in the uh, family's interest, but both economically and socially. Uh, and since uh, opposite sex couples are the ones, only ones that uh, procreate uh, by, by lying next to each other, uh, and uh, we think that this differentiates the situation materially uh, from uh, the request that the same laws be applied uh, to same-sex couples. Frankly, I'm not sure, it seems to us, that they simply aren't uh, comparable. The, the, the equal protection re requires a uh, comparable situation. We think this is not comparable. Um, and in, in large measure, I s would say that the, we think that the third department's decision um, does a sp splendid job in expressing our views. Uh, I'd like to say something about uh, the, um, whether there's a fundamental right under due process. Um, and uh, Judge Smith, you have asked, well, isn't it a matter of uh, how you define it, and I, I suppose it is, but I think it's quite clear uh, and uh, in looking at all the cases, the, f the ones that say that marriage is a fundamental right, it's a recognition that it's always been connected with procreation and the preservation of, uh, of society. Uh, and um, so if you're looking at a fundamental right, you should look at what the basis for the assertion of a fundamental right has been. And uh, I'm, I only go back to the uh, Skinner against Oklahoma, but then you have the Loving case, and you have uh, a number of others that they cite, uh, What about Turner, Turner against Safley. Yeah, well, uh, what, 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 what does Turner have to do with procreation? Well, at that point, the court had, I mean, and that, that, that case, about, that case still, held, didn't it, there's a constitutional right for people who can't possibly procreate to get married. Well, they did indicate, as uh, Mr. Kearney said, that there was a po prospect of that in, in, in the future. Uh, so, I mean, at that point, the court had consistently talked about uh, the fundamental right relating to uh, the marriage between a man and a woman, and of course, historically, that's been how marriage has been viewed. Uh, and a fundamental right, both by this court and the Supreme Court, is something that has been deeply rooted. So, uh, if anything's been deeply rooted, it's the uh, re marriage between man and a woman, and uh, frankly, as the Third Department pointed out, and as we pointed out to them, 
Uh, I think they're simply asking for a redefinition of, of marriage. And that is something that is uh, really appropriate for the legislature to do, uh, not, not for the, uh, the court. Well, but, but, but the legislature obviously could not constitutionally redefine marriage to mean only marriage between people of the same race, correct? So it's not a marriage unless the two people are of the same race? Uh, no, of course not. Uh, why, yeah, is there any real difference between a definition and a substantive limitation? I mean, isn't the state in substance saying only people of the opposite sex can get married? Well, I, I, the question of a fundamental right is you have to see what's the basis for it. It hasn't been historically that just because two people uh, love each other, uh, it's because there has been this relation to uh, the possibility of, uh, of, of the procre procreation. I mean, it's intertwined you're, 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 as, as you're to really how the saying, court said what a fundamental right is. You're, but you're, you're, what you're really saying, aren't you, is that the definition of marriage to include only opposite-sex couples is, is, makes sense, that it's a rational definition. But, well, but, 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 but that's different from saying that, that it's the definition and that's the end of the story. Well, I think it's irrational, and I think it's also what it has been historically viewed. Um, and um, it's, uh, so yes. Um, uh, I, I'd also, in terms of the um, McMinn case, I think it's been relied on a good deal. <laughs> Uh, the main aspect of McMinn and all the predecessor cases involved are zoning cases. And the question is, what, can, what could the legislature do, or the local legislatures is really what's involved in those cases. Uh, how can it uh, restrict the use of somebody's house? and uh, for, for the purposes. Now there's an earlier Supreme Court case that, which had said, well, you can zone in order to provide for uh, single family housing and, and, and the like. And, they, and some of the earlier cases before McMinn, which I think were, seemed to be statutorily based uh, by this court, said, well, you have to have some alternative. It can't be just uh, talking about family and the uh, and at McMinn, the conclusion was that the definition there, uh, where the usage would be, was uh, uh, absurd. But also, it's a criminal law that's involved. And, and, and suppose we disagree with you and say that um, there is a right to marry. What follows from that? What would the consequences be? Well, I mean, it depends on what you say. I mean, we certainly hope you don't do that, but if you say, you know, well, I'm sorry. That the other side said there were no consequences in Massachusetts, and you would expect the same thing here. Would you agree with that? I, I have no way of really speculating uh, whether, in, in terms of the consequences of uh, uh, whether there would be riots or the like, if that's what no, he was no, talking no, no, about, no. or, uh, uh, I mean. I'm not speaking of uh, violence in any matter. I'm, I, I just want to know what would the practical consequences be in terms of anything, economics or? Um, well, I, I assume that uh, if you say that, then at least the benefits and the burdens that exist with respect to uh, married couples now would also apply to the same-sex uh, married couples. You um, can't identify any adverse consequence, Mr. Schiff, can you? No, I, I, I don't, but uh, you, you, I would say you, you, that In fact, your, your client's position is that it might be a good idea, but the legislature should do it, correct? <clears throat> well, we said, yeah, we certainly have no objection to the legislature But could, doing could, it. could a legislature, let me change the question slightly, could a legislature believe, whether your client is saying it or not, or whether you're saying it or not, could a, leg could a rational legislature conclude that changing the traditional definition of marriage would have harmful long-term effects on the family? Um, 
The, uh, there some of the arguments uh, are made in the amicus briefs. I, and, and, and I see you, what, you, what you're saying is other people can make those arguments, but you don't want to. Uh, well, the legislature, yeah, I mean, under rational basis, the legislature, uh, the, the idea, you know, the legislature can make choices. I don't think it's black and white, but we aren't making that argument, and we don't really, wouldn't know exactly, I, I don't think the studies have been such, choices. but we're not making that argument. They can't make choices on moral or religious grounds. Absolutely not. Um, on, on, on the... Uh, question of um, uh, the uh, claim for uh, gender discrimination, I guess I'm in the same position. Actually, I'm, I'm, let me take you back to the, sure. the answer you just gave to Judge Sapir, because that, I understand there are cases that say they can't make choices on moral or religious grounds. Was Brown against Board of Education not a morally based decision? I mean, is moral, does morals have nothing to do with this? Well, I guess Well, Brown, of course, I mean, we were dealing I mean, there with the 14th can, can Amendment and... and, and, and a, but there, isn't there a moral principle underlying the 14th Amendment? The principle of equality that is a moral principle that we all well, respond Well, okay, to. I guess one can say, uh, I think Romer was basically saying that you can't discriminate uh, uh, because uh, a, a particular group is, uh, is, is simply morally objectionable. Uh, which I think is different from Brown Board of Education, which, uh, af after all, uh, undid, uh, I don't know, Plessy against Ferguson, about 50 years of uh, probably a bad decision and, and, and morally objectionable when it was issued. But I mean, so, but I, 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 so maybe my statement is, is too broad, but I think basically I'm still agreeing with Judge Saparic that uh, uh, we, the state, can't act uh, simply because it doesn't like uh, gays and lesbians. Uh, so it's, uh, but I, I was going to say, uh, if on, on gender discrimination, I'm with Ms. Kerner. I have never been able to understand the, uh, the argument as to why this would be gender discrimination. And I mean, we talk about it in our brief, and I guess I will Leave it at that, but I, I am puzzled. And of course, in this case, the main argument has been that uh, there has been uh, gays and lesbians have been discriminated against uh, for years because of their sexual orientation. And if there is any discrimination, uh, unjust in discrimination, I think it's based on sexual orientation and not on, 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 on gender discrimination. And uh, uh, it totally puzzles me. Um, the uh, answer to one of your questions, Judge Kay, according to the uh, census, a census 2000 uh, special report, which I think we cited in our brief, uh, in New York, households comprised of same-sex unmarried partners uh, represent 1.3 percent of all coupled households. Uh, to the extent there's a claim that there is um, under-inclusiveness, uh, the fact is that the, it's, while there are a substantial number of uh, same-sex couples, it's still a very small percentage of under-inclusiveness. Now, the courts have said, at least the Supreme Court has said, that one should act, one, that, that in terms of uh, uh, discrimination uh, or, or, or if the court can act in an incremental fashion, you don't have to deal with everything at one time. Now, th this is a peculiar situation. I mean, this statute was, uh, uh, domestic relations law is, is uh, more or less 100 years old, and I don't think anybody 100 years ago was thinking about um, and the, um, uh, 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 this issue, uh, it just wasn't on the uh, radar screen. Of course, there wasn't any radar then either. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, a good part of the argument that we've heard today and in the briefs uh, 
has been, well, we, we, the same-sex couples have families. Now, this is also a fairly recent phenomenon. I think one of the briefs, Mika's briefs on their side, says really something that's become prevalent perhaps in the last 10 years. So uh, it's certainly the kind of thing that the legislature is one that can deal with this on an incremental basis. And I don't think because there's something relatively new uh, that all of a sudden this law becomes unconstitutional. Uh, So I think Mr. Kerner covered most of these arguments, and uh, I would just ask that you Thank affirm you. the decision Thank below. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. We'll save the time you have left over for your next appearance here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jordan. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Good afternoon. Judge, my name is Patrick Jordan. I'm here with uh, Jeffrey Jamison, both our assistant corporation counsels for Albany. Here for respondent John Marsley, city clerk of Albany. Um, the first point in our first point in our brief is simply the fact that the city clerk does not have the ability to do what the petitioners are asking him to do. He has to follow the domestic relations law as it is written, as it is factually and uh, particularly read and as the Department of Health has specifically instructed him to do. Um, in addressing one of Mr. Kinlan's points, I hadn't, <clears throat> him saying that it is, uh, can be read as he, can be read as she, and Bri can be read as groom, that's the first time I've heard that. And uh, the respondent's reading of the DRL, it, does, it never says simply he or she, it says he and she bride and groom, man and wife. They're very specific. The statute needs to be read as a whole and that this particular section of the statute applies only to man and wife. That is who the state says can marry. Um, I'm not sure that I want to belabor uh, co-counsel's points. Um, in looking at the Anahri case and uh, under 21, all of your honors have brought those cases to light. Um, they do deal in a certain way with sexual orientation. And this court has dealt with sexual orientation as looking at it through a rational basis test. Um, I well, your adversary says sure. that even, Ms. Kaplan says that even looking at it through a um, rational basis test, it fails. Uh, your honor, I would uh, respectfully disagree with that. Um, looking at Anafri and, well, an offer in particular, We're dealing with a state consensual sodomy statute, um, one that dealt with married couples different than unmarried couples. Those are two very distinct groups. Why would they, why were they singled out by legislature? I, I don't know. It also dealt with what could be a uh, potential harm, as in Lawrence, Texas. Um, Texas statute was aimed at the possibility that homosexual sodomy or consensual sodomy would somehow endanger the other person. How can you say that it was not, it could not endanger a married couple in the same fashion? Therefore, it fails the rational basis test. The state legislature, when looking at the, the uh, domestic relations law, does not have to voice what its rational basis was. The, the court can infer what that could be. The uh, co-counsel has stated several times that and so hasn't the petition that the state's most likely aim is at procreation. Um, and as several of your honors have pointed out, the most natural form of procreation that has been brought through the traditions of this country and the state is between man and woman. Um, Judge Graffio did point out that uh, insemination is a viable alternative now. However, the overwhelming majority 
of couples in this state and country uh, rely on natural pregnancy. Um, I would like to point out, I, I have to, we've discussed this amongst each other, that in looking at several of the, the cases that the petitioners are relying on, protect, uh, particularly many of the fundamental cases dealing with <coughs> racism. Um, if, you, if you read the cases that have dealt particularly in that area, it seems <coughs> that the state legislatures there were aiming particularly at that group. That was the goal of the statute. Therefore, it struck down as uh, invidious discrimination. The state, in creating the domestic relations law, looked at, as we've already discussed, the traditional uh, union of man and woman. The fact that a that uh, same-sex couples at a later point were deemed not to fit into the domestic relations law was not the the goal of this legislation, um, and therefore- It has that effect. It may not have been the goal, but it has that effect. <laughs> Correct, Your Honor. But in looking at a rational basis, all of the effects do not have to point you in one direction. The state legislature has a rational basis for why the law has not been changed. And as both sides have pointed out, the state legislature is looking into different ways to improve uh, improve how this group is, is looked upon by the state. Uh, I know the city of Albany and the city of New York have both taken aim at that. Um, the legislature, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't sit year round. They don't uh, work in you know, overarching goals. It has to be taken step by step. They are, it appears, taking incremental steps. There's no reason why this court should stop them from taking those steps. Um, and as the Constitution... Is it, 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 do you agree with the suggestion co-counsel made that maybe they're waiting and hoping, uh, ho hoping we'll bail them out? <laughs> I, I would doubt that, Your Honor. Um, I would assume that if they, in fact, are going to change this law, and how as long as they deem it fit after hearings, and as Your, Your Honor has pointed out, there is no definite empirical data. Maybe they're waiting for that. Maybe they can have hearings. They can have uh, other people come in and, and explain to them how maybe this law can change. However, this court should allow them the chance to examine the law and whether or not they should change it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Ms. Uh, Summer. Thank you. <coughs> Well, there's a lot I'd like to respond to. I know, though, that uh, much of it was addressed in our briefs and that Ms. Kaplan will be covering, especially the uh, arguments that were made with respect to the rational review uh, failure of this legislation. Let me first start with the Baker versus Nelson argument quickly. Uh, it really is an argument of such little merit that even uh, Mr. Uh, Kerner's office Michael Cardoza, in an opinion written March 3, 2004, that's in the record to the defendant in our case, Victor Robles, pointed out that, and, and this is at uh, page 129 of the Hernandez record, uh, that the appellate courts of New York have not addressed whether the statutory exclusion of same-sex couples from the opportunity to marry is consistent with the federal and state constitutions. And as recently as last year, the United States Supreme Court made clear that the constitutional question on the federal level remained an undecided one, citing Lawrence versus Texas. Well, can't, well, can't it be open for them and, and not for us? That is, if, I mean, isn't his logic right that if, if our equal protection clause is no broader than the federal equal protection clause, which we have said, right? You, you have said that, yes, okay, and if, if, if that's true, and if, if, uh, if Baker v. Nelson has not been overruled by the Supreme Court, they may be ready to overrule it tomorrow, but we can't overrule it, can we? Well, you, you aren't, first of all, you, you, the, this court has said that the uh, federal uh, equal protection guarantee and the state, the state may be no broader. However, it is in other situations, in other cases, and, and uh, Judge Kay has written an article in which she says this, there have been occasions when the, the court has certainly done an independent analysis and is not bound 
so by the federal analysis. In, in addition, there have been subsequent doctrinal developments uh, since Baker versus Nelson uh, had its summary dismissal and under Supreme Court precedent. Yeah, but I guess that's what I'm really saying is I assume you're right that there are doctrinal developments which make it possible, likely, highly likely that the Supreme Court would not follow Baker v. Nelson tomorrow. Are we free to say then, okay, Baker v. Nelson is no longer the law? Or does the Supreme think, Court I mean, you, have to say that? I think you're certainly free to say that we're going to construe our state constitution, put Baker versus Nelson aside, say Baker versus Nelson is not controlling precedent, as uh, the Attorney General has said in, in already in, in an opinion uh, cited in our uh, record, and as has been said by some lower federal courts cited in our briefing as well. Well, we'd have to say the Equal Protection Clause in New York is broader. Not necessarily, although uh, it not necessarily, because I think Baker versus Nelson cannot be viewed as good law or precedent binding on any court, federal or state, and certainly not on this on this state. Well, at this I get point. back to Judge Smith's question. I mean, isn't it something different to say that they could change their minds tomorrow? But while that precedent is still out there, it might be it's binding on us to the extent our equal protection clause is coextensive with the federal one? There have been two, for example, two uh, federal district court cases in recent years cited in our brief, the Smelt case and In Re Can Do, that have themselves said that they don't view Baker versus Nelson as binding even on federal courts. So I, I don't think this court even has to, has to go that far. And then I'd like to turn as well so to So what the do you extract as the binding equal protection jurisprudence of the Supreme Court of the United States on this issue? Well, there, it, it, as the uh, uh, opinion I just read says, the, the federal law is, is still, it's still an open question under federal law. I think there are important cases, such as the Zablocki so case. So it's just a completely open issue? It, there, there's a lot of guidance from cases in federal law, ranging from Griswold versus Connecticut, Eisens, the Eisenstadt case, which uh, held that the right to privacy and autonomy in making decisions about whether or not to use contraception was not just a right for married couples, but also a right for the unmarried, and required the court not to define a right in narrow group-based terms. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you agree with, with Justice Scalia that in, uh, in, in Lawrence v. Texas basically makes, uh, makes it impossible for the uh, Supreme Court not to hold that, uh, that gay marriage is permissible? Well, I, I certainly do believe that Lawrence versus Texas's teaching and the methodology it follows uh, does uh, mean that any, any fair application of uh, due process and equal protection doctrine should lead to the conclusion that it is unconstitutional to uh, deprive same-sex couples of access to civil marriage. Yes. So when they said we're not deciding that and Justice Scalia said don't believe it, you think he was right? Actually, I, I believe that Justice, what Justice Scalia was right about is that uh, Lawrence is a case that makes very clear how other courts need to address the question of marriage rights for same-sex couples. I, I think that the Lawrence majority certainly didn't reach the question and uh, was careful to you know, make clear that it wasn't. But I also think Lawrence is important for questions that have come up earlier about whether we're, we're asking the court to define uh, a new right to so-called same-sex marriage or to simply acknowledge that the right to marry, the well-settled fundamental right to marry, can't be defined so narrowly on group-based terms to exclude an historically uh, excluded group. And in Lawrence, the court overruled Bowers versus Hardwick, which the Lawrence court said uh, Lawrence, Bowers's description of the right at stake as, and, and in Bowers court said it was facetious to claim that there was a right to homosexual sodomy. The Lawrence court said that misapprehended the nature of the right at stake. It was a right to uh, individual autonomy in making decisions about one's private uh, sexual relationships and bonds with another and that it demeaned the dignity of lesbian and gay people. So Had Baker relied? On, um, oh. <laughs> on, uh, on Bowers? Yes. No, Baker predates Bowers. Uh, I'd like to also turn to the uh, discussion about the Turner versus Safley case because uh, I do believe that Turner is, is a case that's very on point and important and, and uh, I don't think that it's fair to characterize it the way I heard it characterized earlier. I think you know, Turner versus Safley upholding the right of a prison inmate uh, to 
marry, it was clear that that prison inmate had no uh, ability to engage in procreative activity. And if there's any question about it, if we just look at the decision of the court below in the Eighth Circuit, which we did cite in our briefs, it's 777 F. 2nd 1307, in which uh, the Eighth Circuit Court rejected the argument that uh, a restriction on a prisoner's right to go through the formal ceremony of marriage does not amount to an infringement on a fundamental right because those aspects of a marriage which make it a basic civil right, quote, cohabitation, sexual intercourse, and the beginning and raising of children are, are already precluded by the fact of incarceration. The court rejected that and said, this argument ignores the elements of emotional support and public acknowledgement and commitment which are central to the marital relationship. Those words were echoed in the Supreme Court opinion in, in uh, Turner itself and made clear that it is, is simply a misstatement um, and a misunderstanding of what's important about the fundamental right to marry to say it hinges on procreative abilities or intentions. That's simply never been, uh, the, that has not been the law in, in any recent decades and especially since Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965 when the Supreme Court said there uh, is a fundamental right of married couples to use contraception and they're no less married for having made that decision. Um, I'd like to also clear up one uh, other point. Uh, Ms. Kaplan said, and I think this is actually it was a misstatement, that uh, only heightened scrutiny applies as well to a fundamental rights violation. And, and that, I don't believe that to be the case. It, it is a question of uh, strict scrutiny when a fundamental right is burdened to this extent. I'd like to conclude, racing against the clock here, um, to respond to concerns that this is a matter that should be left to the legislature. But when constitutional rights are at stake and the legislature is uh, falling short of protecting them, it is quintessentially the role of the court. And this principle is of such importance that it has been more memorialized on the very walls of this courthouse. Just in the next room, hanging in the library, um, are these words, never more apt today, and I'm, I'm quoting the chief judge here, the role of the courts as impartial protectors of individual rights can provoke controversy, especially in hard cases involving unpopular causes or litigants. Yet it is precisely because independent tribunals decide cases according to the law and not the opinion polls that so many, including vocal critics, immediately turn to the courts for protection and relief when their own important rights are at stake. The legislature can't pick and choose whose fundamental rights will be respected they're the birthrights of all New Yorkers and must be guarded by the court for all of us. Thank you, Ms. Summer. Ms. Kaplan? Well, I'm a little tired at this point, Your Honors, but I'm going to try to speak as quickly as Mr. Kerner did so I can get through all my points. Um, the Baker v. Nelson point, I think, need not detain you long. Take a look at the Onofre case. This court has talked about what the meaning of a summary dismissal is of the United States Supreme Court, and it said as follows. In the, that circumstance, the disposition by the Supreme Court does not necessarily signify approval of the reasoning by which the lower court resolved the case. Well, but, but your, your adversary says that was after an analysis of the particular circumstances of that dismissal. I mean, but we know the circumstances of the Baker v. Nelson was dismissed for want of substantial federal question. Doesn't Supreme, that mean what it says? The Supreme Court has said the exact same thing about its own summary dismissals, Judge Smith. So you're saying that a summary a dismissal for want of substantial federal question is not precedent? It's precedent, but it's not binding precedent on the reasoning of the court below. And the Supreme Court said exactly the same, the same thing. But it does establish that, that, no, that no substantial federal question was raised. The Supreme Court dismissed it for want of substantial federal question at the time that Baker v. Nelson was decided. The Supreme Court, about its own summary dismissals, has said you can't rely on them for the reasoning below. In this not for the reasoning below, but I don't quite see how there can be no substantial federal question in Baker v. Nelson and uh, there be a substantial question in this case. Oh, I, I think that's clear. Baker v. Nelson, you can't rely on the reasoning below. The reasoning below was reasoning at that time. Forget about the reasoning. How, can, how could Baker, how could, how could one of the, whichever party lost in Baker v. Nelson lose uh, and you win? Because the Supreme Court's basically said you can't rely on our summary dismissals as binding precedent that governs going forward on the, on the reasoning below. It's not binding precedent, Your Honor. Ms. Kaplan, if rational basis is the standard, why hasn't that been met here? If rational basis is the standard, why has it been met? It hasn't been met because every justification that's been offered doesn't work. Let me, let well, me try the procreation one, okay. which is the one that has been so 
extensively urged sure. by your adversaries. Let, let me be clear on procreation. First of all, we're not running away from procreation, Your Honors. We believe that there is, of course, procreation has something to do with marriage. But the problem with the procreation argument, it is, and I see Bob's, uh, Judge Smith, excuse me, laughing, it has a lot to do with marriage. We can see that too. The, the point is, is that in the analysis this court did, does under the rational basis test, in Onofre, in McMinn, in Liberta, in Levin, it looks not only at the people who are included in the classification, but it looks at the people who are excluded by the classification. And to answer one of George Bundy Smith's questions, there are 46,000, more than 46,000 families in this state that are same-sex families with children. And there is no dispute here that there is no rational interest being served in procreation, in stable families, or in healthy children, happy children, and excluding those families from the benefits of marriage. If you look at the exclusion as you did in those cases, you can't conclude it's rational. It, there's absolutely no connection. Um, let me um, go to, there's been a lot of talk this afternoon about the legislature. Um, the real question here, there is a bill pending in the legislature. It's been sitting for a long time. With all respect to the co-equal branch of government, uh, it's not a legislature that's known for being the most activist in the country. This court knows that, unfortunately, all too well in the CFE case. But, but that's not really the question before you. The question before you, is, as Judge Kay just pointed out, is whether there's a rational basis. If there's no rational basis, then this court must strike the statute, regardless of what the legislature is doing or isn't doing. Let me talk about tradition. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk this afternoon about tradition. I think we can all agree that tradition standing alone doesn't meet the rational basis test. And the reason it doesn't, first of all, this court said it didn't in Onofre and Liberta. But putting that aside, the reason it doesn't as a matter of logic is because there's no difference between the classification and the interest. Yes, there's a tradition of excluding gay men and lesbians from marriage. But that tradition doesn't justify continuing the tradition into the future. There's no difference, and as the court explained in Romer, when there's no difference between the classification and the interest that fails rational basis. Shouldn't, shouldn't I mean, I see a problem. Should, shouldn't we have a certain humility in face of the fact that for centuries the, the classification has not only been made but assumed? I mean, that is, until, uh, until 50 years ago, uh, almost no one would have thought that marriage meant anything else than marriage between a man and a woman. Is that irrelevant? That brings me to my next point, Judge Smith. I'm glad you asked the question. If it doesn't meet rational basis tests... Well, how, how, how about first whether is it irrelevant or not? It, it, it's, yes, if there's no other independent state interest that meets the rational basis interest. Marital rape exemption existed in history for hundreds and hundreds of years. For hundreds of years it was okay for a man to rape his wife. And this court did not hesitate, hesitate for a second, to say that that did not meet the rational basis test, despite at the time the fact that 40 other states had marital rape exemptions. The same thing is true for consensual sodomy. <coughs> Again, it seems funny today, but I think we can all agree that at the time that this court decided in Ofre in 1980, it was a long-standing, multi-century tradition from the beginning of time, as I think has been said earlier, to, to criminalize consensual sodomy between consenting adults. Most states at the time did, and the Supreme Court six years later said it was okay, which goes to the question of how the equal protection clauses are interpreted differently by the federal courts and by this court. Again, this court didn't hesitate to say that despite that tradition, it was unconstitutional and did not meet rational basis given the reasons that were proffered to have a criminal statute that uh, prohibited consensual sodomy and had a marital exemption. Um, let me um, talk about the Brown case. You asked a question about the Brown case, and you said, wasn't the dis result in the Brown case moral? Of course it was. But the issue here is whether moral disapproval standing alone is sufficient. In Brown, there were a host of other reasons that compelled the court's result, including the fact that it was clearly good public policy to eliminate separate but equal schools. Again, there is no good public policy that has been offered by the city, by the state, or even by amici for why my clients and these appellants should be denied the rights to marriage. Let me talk about the different standard. Um, it is true that in the Dorsey case, in the cases that followed it, this court has said that with respect to the state action requirement, the federal constitution and the state constitution are equivalent. I want to say a couple things about that. First of all, 
let's talk about the Dorsey case for a second. It was decided in the late 1940s. It upheld segregation at Stuyvesant Town. That's what the case did. I would respectfully submit to your honors that if this court were to hear the Dorsey case again today, it would not rule that way. In addition, the Dorsey case was decided before PJ video. PJ video says that in order to decide whether any aspect of the state constitution gets interpreted more broadly, you looked at the, the distinct culture, history, and tradition of the state. This court has said many times that with respect to due process, even though the language is identical, basically identical, this court interprets due process more broadly because of the distinctive history, culture, and tradition of New York State. I would respectfully submit to your honors that there is no difference in the culture, history, or tradition of New York between protections of due process and the protections of equal protection. Um, in addition to that, with respect to the way these, this court conducts rational basis review, I said earlier that I didn't want to put words into your mouth about what you do, but there's absolutely no doubt that when you're doing rational basis in case like these, you look at the exclusion. Let me quote Judge Simons in the McMinn case. He couldn't have been more clear about this. He said, by limiting occupancy of single family homes to persons related by blood, the Oyster Bay Ordinance impermissibly excluded, his words, excluded many households who pose no threat to the goal of preserving the character of the traditional single family neighborhood. Again, the same logic applies here. There is nothing about excluding my clients and these appellants, many of whom are sitting in this room, from the benefits of marriage that does anything to help procreation, to help stable families, or to do any public interest that's been asserted uh, by the city or by the state. Um, uh, Judge Smith, you asked a question about this. Does, does, the, does the exclusion have to have, to have a benefit? Or is it, is it enough to show that the exclusion does not offer the same, that, that the excluded class does not advance the goals of the legislation to the same degree? Wouldn't that be a rational basis? You have to, you have to conclude that the excluded class advances the goals of the legislation. The legislation that's been, the goal of the legislation that's been proffered here is having stable families for children. There is nothing about excluding the class here that in any way furthers that interest. Well, my question is, does it have to further the interest if it, if it, if it does not, uh, obviously there's a certain cost to the institution of marriage. People who are married get a lot of benefits, which are all over your briefs, and the rest of, a, the, the, rest of the public pays for them. Right. Uh, do we have to extend those benefits to another class if the legislature could reasonably conclude that the benefits of, uh, are not offered to the same degree by including that class in the group? Uh, well, cost, it can, the, court, the legislature cannot consider. If you look at what the court said in Romer, the justification in the Romer case was simply cost. We sh gays and lesbians shouldn't have rights in Colorado because it would be more costly for them to have the rights. And the Supreme Court made it really clear that cost alone is insufficient. What was really well, I'm, but, but I, uh, what I was really asking was whether in deciding uh, for whom to incur these costs, can the legislature not consider the extent to which the objectives of the legislation will be advanced? That is, does it have to, does the excluded class, does including the excluded class actually have to harm the objectives? I or do you just to, say that it does not advance I them as much? I have to tell you, in McMinn, Judge Smith, I don't think there were a lot of families in Oyster Bay that wanted to live in these homes uh, where it was, you know, there was no statistical evidence of how many single people or, or couples who were unmarried wanted to live in these homes. And that didn't hesitate for a second in preventing Judge Simons from saying men that the under-inclusion and that the fact that the exclusion didn't meet the interest didn't fail rational basis. There's not a statistical requirement under this case precedence. And surely, I think we can all agree that 46,000, more than 46,000 families is not an insignificant number. Uh, with respect uh, to Judge Smith, two real quick things. His question about the studies, um, that is cited in, the, um, in our brief. Um, there's a footnote 64 uh, on page 34 of our brief. Oh, the, oh, excuse me, the American Psychological Association's brief. There are a number of studies cited there. If you want to read just one of them, Judge Smith, I would commend the first one cited. Um, and I would point out on that fact that even James Q. Wilson, who submitted the amicus brief on the other side, even Professor Wilson concedes that there's absolutely no studies that show that there's any harm to children from being raised in gay and lesbian families. Who, who, has, the, who has the burden of proof on that issue? What? Who has the burden on that issue? That is, can... We have the burden, but I think we've met the burden. Um, and let me go to um, the final point. And the final point has to do with respect to this question of incrementalism. Um, 
And I understand basically the arguments that have been made by the other side is that you should allow the legislature to experiment here. What I would submit to your honors is that given the hundreds of protections and issues that are uh, afforded to people based on marriage, given the rights and protections that are afforded to at least those 46,000 families, to allow the New York State Legislature to do it piecemeal, where it could be decades and decades before those children and those families have the full rights and protections that their, the family across the street has, is not consistent with this court's jurisprudence. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kemp. All please rise. Massachusetts is the only state that currently allows gay couples to marry. This is part two of the oral argument in four New York same-sex marriage cases. You can watch part one with attorneys arguing for gay marriage at cspan.org. Just click on America and the Courts. And join us next week for America and the Courts, Saturday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. The House this week passed a non-binding resolution on the Iraq War, 256 to 153. It declares that it's not in the national interest to set a date for troop withdrawal and that the U.S. will prevail in the war on terror. Forty-two Democrats joined 214 Republicans voting for the resolution. The House is back for legislative business Monday. Next week's agenda includes defense spending, a bill giving the president a modified line-item veto, and reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. The House is live on C-SPAN. And the Senate returns Monday to continue work on the defense authorization bill. The U.S. Senate's live on C-SPAN.